Good afternoon and Happy New Year to you all, both those of you here and watching online. I finished my last lecture in this series on art in China by stressing its global connectedness. And I want to pick up where I left off. Obviously, <clears throat> this 1929 book cover design for a collection of short stories by the writer Lu Xun, it draws less on indigenous Chinese forms of picturing than it does on a global language of avant-garde modernism. It's wrapped around a volume of stories by a writer who enjoyed a huge reputation, who was a founder of the politically engaged League of Left-Wing Writers in 1930, and whose impact on the visual arts was as great as it was on literature. The image on the right of the screen shows a modern rendering of a much mythologized encounter he brokered in 1931 between a group of young Chinese artists and the Japanese woodcut artist Uchiha Makakichi, a proponent of the new trend for the creative print, Sosaku Hanga in Japanese. So when we think about the great print artists of early modern Japan, the Hokusais and the Hiroshigis, we often forget that they were designers rather than makers of prints. The carving and the inking and the printing was left in the hands of a whole troop of skilled artisans. The creative print artist insisted on the necessity for the single personality being responsible for all aspects of the creative process. Lu Xun, who was himself effectively bicultural in Chinese and Japanese, with many Japanese friends and a deep engagement with its contemporary culture, he sought to meld that commitment to personal making with a political engagement of a contemporary European artist like the German feminist, pacifist, and political radical Kete Kollwitz, with whom he corresponded and whose work he himself collected. The result of this sort of interaction can be seen in a print like this one from 1932, with its strongly expressionist contrasts of white and black and its very clear chisel marks, the visible index of the integrity of making associated by Lu Xun and his associates with the artist's hand. But while it's clearly inspired by ideas about the arts, which we might loosely group under the term modernism, the woodcut movement is also at least partly a revolt against the modern, or against those aspects of the mass-produced, consumer-driven modern which its proponents abhorred. The 1934 print, Unemployed by Li Hua, takes a politically radical position in its focus on the misery of the urban proletariat. And here he's a sort of universal man who could be in Shanghai or in Chicago. But it also positions itself in opposition to the colored commercial posters, which were by now ubiquitous parts of the urban scene. The example on the left isn't selling soap or cigarettes, but rather it's selling the fake state of Manju Guo, which by 1931, which in 1931, was carved out of the three huge resource-rich provinces of northeastern China to the benefit of a Japanese empire which had begun its encroachment on China even before the end of the imperial system in 1911. But the 1931 annexation of the three eastern provinces marked a massive ramping up of Japanese ambitions to dominate, if not to extinguish, the sovereignty of the Chinese Republic. All of the art of the period was created in the shadow of that aggression, even if it chose to respond in very different ways. Li Hua, studying oil painting in Japan in 1931, returned home in enraged disgust at this point. The fact that by 1934 he'd taken up the medium of woodcut with its Japanese roots is just one slightly ironic example of the complexity which individuals had to negotiate. So the rhetoric, especially the retrospective rhetoric surrounding the woodblock print, made it out to be a popular medium. But in fact, hardly anyone saw these works at the time. So wedded were key figures to the authenticity of the maker's hand 
that the works contained in these issues of the journal Modern Print were all actual impressions from the woodblock. No reproductive technologies of the despised mass media were allowed. The first issue had printed 500 copies, but after criticism from Lu Xun over the use of mechanical presses, the second hand-printed issue was of a mere 50 copies. So if anybody saw these works, it was because they were reproduced in the popular illustrated journals of the day. This was also the medium through which any size of audience at all in China saw the work of another strand of the avant-garde, those committed to a practice of painting as part of an international transcendence of likeness into a form of painting which could be universal. Here, in a photograph from 1933, the young dandies of the Storm Society, and, and please note, this is very much a boys' club, they stare defiantly at an indifferent world with the avant-garde mixture of surliness and bravado seen in artists at this time in Buenos Aires, in Helsinki, in Cairo, as much as in Paris. One of them is Pang Xunqin, creator of the work on the right. And this is now a textbook standard in surveys of modern Chinese art, not least because, although it's long lost, it's one of relatively few works to which the popular illustrated magazine Liang Yo, that's Young Companions, devoted a full page color reproduction. Pang spent a full five years from 1925 to 1930 in a Paris still globally recognized as the center of the art world, following in the footsteps of the slightly older Lin Feng Mian, whose work I introduced in my last lecture, and whose nude of 1934, and this is a rare surviving actual work of the interwar avant-garde, I'm showing you this now. But neither Pang Xunqin nor Lin Feng Mian made a living out of selling work of this kind, for which a Chinese audience simply did not exist. Lin was gainfully employed through the 1930s as director of the new state-sponsored art academy in Hangzhou, while Peng Xunqin found work in the world of commercial graphics and design. This was the medium through which a whole range of modernist trends were introduced to a wide audience, if a predominantly urban one. The artists in China who were making a living from their work, and often it was an extremely good living in the 1930s, were artists working in the manner which by this time was firmly understood by the new term guohua, meaning literally national painting. The newspapers were full of advertisements soliciting commissions from the urban middle class, and the actual practice of guohua was itself extremely various a broad spectrum of work that ranged from the extremely historicist to pictures which seemed to wish much more to explore new boundaries of the possible in the medium of brush, ink, and colors on paper. But at the same time as boundaries were being pushed, boundaries were being drawn, and the self-consciously new practice of Guo Hua was becoming circumscribed by a term which I have been scrupulous and careful not to use up to now, that's traditional Chinese painting. Now this wording comes of course not out of a Chinese context, but out of the presence of works and painters from China in an international one. Here we see the painter Liu Hai Su performing in London in 1935 um, in the context of a wave of exhibitions of in European cities in the mid-1930s of modern Chinese painting. But these exhibitions all collapsed that category into that of Guohua alone. So this was the only modern Chinese painting. As the German curator and critic Wilhelm Kohn wrote in 1934 when he was reviewing the Berlin exhibition, he said, equally popular in China, is a school of painting which employs the same techniques and subjects as Western oil painting. But this doesn't concern us here, since it was not included in the exhibition, and rightly so. The sting is in the tail, and rightly so, since it delegitimizes as contemporary art 
The equally large range of work, which he admits exists, but not executed in ink and colors on paper. So, to pause for a moment over just one example of what for Cohen and his Western peers isn't contemporary Chinese art, this is After the Bath by Fang Jinbi, yet another of those lost works we know only from reproduction, this time not from a magazine, but from a volume devoted to the artist's work, a measure of the esteem in which she was held. Here's a rather lovely photograph of the artist with her classmates and her aged teacher, hers very visibly the sole Asian face in a sea of young bohemian Frenchness. If we go back to the painting, executed many years after her return from France, observe that the posture of the nude finger renders race invisible to us even as the one-stroke polyph technique of the bamboo in the upper left corner, as well as the circular window which frames it, gestures towards an Asian setting of the scene. Studied and deliberate ambiguity is present too in the way the work is signed by the artist in the bottom right corner, where she has written her name both in French transcription and in Chinese characters, but written not with the Chinese brush used for calligraphy and painting, but with the squared off oil painting brush she has used to depict the scene. Now I find in this picture, as in a whole range of other pictures of this period, a refusal of either or, of an Eastern Western binary, which makes these lost works both poignant and prescient. Feng Junbi could be, indeed she probably was at the time, characterized as a new woman, a figure of fascination and fantasy and fear in Republican China. A predominantly urban phenomenon, the new woman stood both for the nation and embodied its vulnerabilities. New Woman, from 1935, was the title of one of the most successful films of Shanghai's hugely popular cinema industry of the 1930s, complementing the nascent global visual culture of Hollywood for Shanghai audiences. Indeed, in today's globalized world, if you Google tragic dead film star 1930s, the first thing that comes to you is the story of this woman, Ran Ling Yu, star of New Woman, dead of an overdose at the age of 24 before the film's release. Her funeral procession brought Shanghai to a halt. Her celebrity and her vulnerability are the flip side of the fight for women's place in modern China. Much of it carried on in the pages of magazines like this one, aimed at an urban and educated female readership. But at the same time, in the world of a wider visual culture, the female body was placed into a familiar relationship with modern commerce, as here, where the new woman, her flesh whitened, and her body positioned in the setting of a Renaissance garden, coquettishly sets about the serious business of selling a soap. An image like this is part of the urban scene, which is itself postered, uh, pictured in the photolithographic posters of the era, era as here, in an image of a hypermodern Shanghai. This is recognizably Nanjing Road, with its department stores and cinemas, but there's a surfeit of cars and trams and buses and airplanes to underline the heady rush of modernity. The context in which these images were viewed can be seen in a photograph, which itself appeared in the illustrated magazine Liang Yo, allowing its readership to scopophilically enjoy the viewing of humbler fellow citizens. They're reduced to enjoying this display of posters pinned up for sale in one of the city streets. And you can see on the right, the kind of sexy new woman image, which was used to market a whole range of goods, along with the very idea of modernity itself. So this is the kind of context in which a viewer might have seen a more decorous but equally complex image of modern womanhood. This is a poster showing the new woman as mother of the nation. 
She's clad in the chipao, uh, a form of modern dress with only tenuous connection to what women wore in the imperial period, but a bit like guohua or national painting, this would ultimately serve to signify modernity's opposite and enabler, that is, the traditional. Her daughter, by contrast, wears a Shirley Temple dress and her son a military uniform with the emblem of the Republic on his cap. A pagoda, signifier of the Chinese land, is dimly visible in the far background. Where is father? Well, the implication, as in the famous What Did You Do in the War, Daddy? poster, is that he too is in uniform, actively defending the nation that his women and children love. It needed a lot of defending. The Sino-Japanese War of 1937 to 1945, known in Chinese as the War of Resistance to Japan, is by any standard one of the most traumatic and devastating of all the conflicts roiled together in the dark mid-20th century. Estimates of the death toll vary from the huge to the unthinkably huge. The official statistics of China today count 20 million Chinese dead, and 15 million wounded. Up to half a million Japanese troops also died. The war created 95 million refugees as China's east coast was occupied and government, business, schools and universities relocated to the west. There's one image, um, and it's a horrific image, so I issue the necessary warning before I show it. This image came to stand in the wider world for the savagery of a war waged against civilians without restraint. This is the photograph entitled Bloody Saturday, taken by the photographer H.S. Wong and published in the American Life magazine in October of 1937, showing an abandoned infant in the ruins of a railway station. It's been reliably estimated that 136 million people had seen this photograph within a month of its first publication. And although it was contested as fake news by Japanese propaganda outlets, it was decisive in swinging sympathy behind China's fight for survival, especially in the USA. It's perhaps not so surprising that the image encapsulating such a brutish and such a modern war for the rest of the world should be a news photograph. But today within China itself, another work of art is arguably just as famous as the visual signifier of the War of Resistance. This is a woodblock print from 1938 made by Li Hua, the artist of the unemployed print, which I showed you earlier in this lecture. It's entitled Roar China, and it takes its name from an anti-imperialist play of the same name by the Soviet writer Sergei Tretyakov, which was first staged in 1926. Tretyakov was shot in Stalin's purges in 1937, the year before the print was made, and crucially, this time, reproduced in illustrated magazines, a number of which had participated in the retreat to the new capital of the Chinese Republic in Chongqing, in the southwest of China. It was the mass media which made Roar China an icon of patriotic resistance, in which its bound and brutalized figure reaches for the knife that will free him and wreak revenge on his captors. In the shock and horror of invasion and defeat, the woodcut artist's hostility to the commercial media had to give way to an acceptance of the reach and audience that they could only command. At the same time, strong and assertive positions were being laid down about what art could and should, and indeed must, do. One such voice is that of the leftist writer and cartoonist Chen Yi Fan, alias Jack Chen. He was born in Trinidad in 1908 and educated in London and Moscow, experiences which made him a vocal, if untypical, example of the cosmopolitan Chinese intellectual. He wrote the following in January 1937, just months before the Sino-Japanese War broke out. 
And he wrote it in an English language journal, but one much read by Anglophone Chinese intellectuals. He said, only that art can be considered modern that is inspired by revolutionary democratic nationalism. The test of a modern art is its value to the progress of China. It is the prime need of China and her millions to be able to see and feel and visualize things realistically. In the creation of a realistic art, the artist completely fulfills his social and political duties. Now this sense of the artist, like the writer, as having duties would only intensify in wartime. What was perhaps new was the confident assertion that only one style, that of realism, would do in the fulfilling of those duties. But what did realistic mean in this context? Here are two paintings from the year 1937, just at the outbreak of the war. Both would have been characterized as Guohua, a national painting, though I hope you agree that they look rather different. The Wang Jiqian on the left is by an artist who, although young, had an established career working in a mode which many collectors at the time found attractive. This one continues her long-held practice of identifying openly the old master to whose style it is a response. The Xu Bei Hong on the right is executed in what are technically the same media of brush and ink, but that's more or less where the similarity stops. For one thing, the Xu Bei Hong is of a specific real place as opposed to an idealized or generic landscape. It shows the distinctive karst topography along the Li River near the city of Guilin in the deep southwest of China. Now this had never, or hardly ever, been the subject of a painting prior to the 20th century. Guilin, for all its beauties, was largely off the map of pre-modern elite tourism, and it was only the crises of wartime when the National Central University was relocated out of the reach of the Japanese war machine. That's what brought Xu Bei Hong and painters like him to this hitherto remote part of the country. This picture's fixed point perspective and the representation in particular of the reflection of the mountains in the water, all of these mark this out as a work which uses a set of picturing conventions which Xu had honed in Paris, even if he'd first learned them in China. He falls therefore within the scope of what at least some people, and Xu would have been one of them, what they understood by realistic. Guohua and realism aren't opposites for him here. And he surely felt the same about this portrait of a coolly poised Sun Do Tzu, the artist who at various times in her life was his pupil and also his lover. I think this is one of the most successful and intriguing paintings in Xu's entire very large output. Just as the previous picture showed a real place, this shows a real person, portrayed this time not in ink, but in oils, and so making it not guohua, but yanghua, literally foreign painting. Behind the main figure, and it plays ambiguously with stasis and motion through the rocking chair in which she sits, behind her are a number of plaster casts, studio props and teaching aids. Flanked by two classical goddesses, which are the shorthand for European classical civilization, and remember this is before the start of the European War, in between them are two plaster casts of death masks. Tolstoy on the left and Lenin on the right. The continuity of culture, literature and art, and the solidity melting frenzy of revolution in one painting. Calm as the scene looks, I think we do have to see this as a wartime painting, realistic certainly, but also pushing at realism's capacity to hold in place the enormity of war, trauma, and disaster. Now I'm taking this painting seriously, but its first viewers surely also saw it in the context of the myriad depictions of the female form which had been part of the visual culture of a pre-war world, and indeed continued to be so, in cities under Japanese occupation. 
A third picture by Xu Bei Hong from this period grapples, and I think in this case less successfully, it grapples with the attempt to hold the painterly possibilities of Guo Hua and the life drawing class within the same framework. The human figure and the expressive brushwork of the tree seem here to occupy two different and incompatible worlds for all the painter's sincerity in trying to reconcile them. But what of this art's value to the progress of China? Were Chinese millions really demanding the right to be able to see and feel and visualize things realistically, as Chen Fan put it? It's during wartime that we see the first tentative beginnings of artists not only talking about China's largely illiterate, overwhelmingly rural population, but also attempting to talk to them. Now, of course, some artists had always done this. It's just that they were the anonymous makers of images like these ones, the woodblock printed door gods or New Year pictures, which had been produced for some centuries in their hundreds of thousands, probably even their millions. There were many kinds of New Year pictures, lucky images, scenes from drama, even increasingly political subjects and images of urban modernity. <coughs> they were the products of specialist workshops distributed by peddlers to rural peasant households well beyond the reach of modern media such as newspapers. Some of the most widespread, popular and tenacious types were protective images of deities designed to be pasted up on the doors of village homes, hence their name of door gods. With their keen sense of what often illiterate rural customers actually wanted to buy, it's hardly surprising that the anonymous artists of door god workshops should turn their hands to images like this extremely rare surviving example of an early resistance war door god. <coughs> It has a simple and direct slogan, fight Japan, save China. That's the only indication of its contemporary relevance. And I apologize for showing you this and similar objects in, in black and white reproduction. Without the words, which presumably many people had to have read to them, we would have no idea of what this god was being invoked to protect his purchasers from. The same can't be said of what is possibly the first attempt by a named urban artist to co-opt the visual language of the door god to the immediate necessities of patriotic propaganda. This uh, resistance war door god was originally printed in the magazine Liang Yo in April 1939. Its artist, Lai Shao Qi, had been one of the activists of the pre-war woodcut movement high-mindedly dead set in its opposition to the ice cream for the eyes represented by a magazine like Liang Yo. But it must have been becoming clear to many that high-mindedness would not get the message across. Celebrate victory in the war of resistance, says the slogan held up by the children. Dwarfed by the figure of the helmeted cavalryman and the billowing flag of the Republic behind him. But at this point, Victory must have seemed far off and far from certain. The image as it comes down to us is only in the periodicals reproduction. In the bold colours, I'm sorry again, this is black and white. In the bold colours, which were such a feature of real door gods, even though the earlier commitment of Lai Shao Qi was rigorously to the possibilities of black and white alone. The reach and circulation of such an image beyond its presence in the pages of the magazine is uncertain. And the same is true of another attempt to make the gods and the defenders of the nation coalesce into one another in a work from 1940, seen here on the left. Much closer to the rural originals is the print um, uh, on the right, which shows the popular newspaper cartoon character, Nyobiza, it literally means ox nose, this shows him in the guise of a resistance war door god. So this is the Chinese equivalent of Popeye or Mickey Mouse selling war bonds to, to a British or American audience in World War II. This is a figure from popular culture, certainly, but it's from an urban popular culture of cheap print and newspapers. 
uh, one which had relocated itself and hence put its professional creators in much closer touch with the way the majority of the Chinese population actually lived and the, issues, the images they wished to consume. That majority will have had very little idea who the character of Neil Beadza was, but they might well have recognized this as a sort of door god, an image very far from the realism which a leftist intellectual like Chen Yifan had claimed that China's millions thirsted for. The struggles and uncertainties to make art a, genuinely, a genuine part of a genuinely national resistance are visible in a once famous, long lost, and recently rediscovered work by Xu Bei Hong, working this time in the medium of oils. It shows the famous actress Wang Ying in the role of fragrance, an impoverished singing girl forced to perform in the street to keep herself and her tyrannical father. The cry of, put down your whip, is directed at him by a member of her audience as her father threatens to beat her for not making enough money to feed them. In the original 1931 version, this was accompanied by exhortations to unite and fight the oppressive nationalist government. But by 1938, this playlet had been rewritten several times on themes of patriotic resistance to the Japanese. Its easily understood call for Chinese to set aside internal differences and unite against an external enemy made it an ideal propaganda vehicle for illiterate and literate audiences alike. And it was performed thousands of times by hundreds of different castes in all parts of China and the Chinese diaspora. The famous and glamorous actress Wang Ying, here dressed down in the blue and white cotton of a simple peasant girl, performed it in Singapore, which is where Xu Bei Hong painted this version of it in 1938. And she went on to perform it for the Roosevelts in the White House in 1942. Very few in China will have seen the painting at the time, but very many will have seen the reproduction of it, which appeared again in Liang Yo magazine, more or less when the paint was still wet. Its production showed the artist pitching in to do his patriotic bit in a way which was not so immediately visible in the other major commission on which he was working at the time, a full-size portrait of the British colonial governor of Singapore, clad in full imperial regalia of gilded trousers and feathered hat. Commissions to paint portraits of British imperial grandees might pay the rent and might certainly count as a practice of artistic realism. But at this period, Xu Bei Hong and I'm using him here to stand in for a, a number of other artists. He did also make serious efforts to find a visual language suitable to wartime conditions and wartime needs. Few visual tropes of 20th century Chinese art are more familiar to global audiences than the numerous pictures of horses which Xu painted at this time. And there's such a cliche that it's actually hard to see them now afresh or understand what role they might have been trying to play. They weren't by any means an innovation in Xu's own art. The horse on the right was painted in 1932, but they were easily assimilated to ideas about vigor, force, and dash, all qualities which the Chinese public desperately needed to be able to find in the patchy military response of the nationalist government to the Japanese onslaught. He must have painted them by the hundreds although no complete catalogue exists. And they become a kind of artistic gesture which gains both force and a sort of inevitability from endless repetition. They exist alongside works like the Singapore oil paintings or like the portrait of the Nobel Prize winning Bengali writer and artist Rabindranath Tagore, which Xu Bei Hong painted in 1940 as his wartime wanderings took him to the aged sages retreat in British India. It's therefore a bit dangerous to say, as, as some textbooks hint, that there was a move from oil painting to guohua on ideological or nationalist grounds in wartime. Rather, we can say that a rather particular set of wartime iconography can be observed across a whole range of media at this time. So the theme of animals, as in Xu Bei Hong's bounding horses and soaring eagles, 
We can also see it in the work of the photographer Lang Jing Shan, who's manipulated photographs like this lion roaring out a defiance against a background of lofty peaks. This shows a coming together of new technologies and old formats to create a new type of synthesis. The other work by him on the slide shows the mighty mountains of China, again a work which alludes to rather than copies from pre-modern types of painting. I think we have to see this sort of visualization of, in, as a sort of visualization of the single most important Chinese wartime slogan, Huan Wo He Shan, give back our land, or more literally, our rivers and mountains. This is a battle cry um, originally associated with a great patriotic warrior of the 11th century, but used in the 20th century as a rallying cry for national resistance to Japanese and other forms of imperialism. This, I think, in turn should make us think about the continued practice of guohua in the period of the War of Resistance, as carried out by artists living in the unconquered Southwest on the left, or in areas under Japanese occupation as on the right. I'd like to suggest, we might think here of the British war artist like Paul Nash. I'd like to suggest that in wartime, the very act of painting the landscape, painting the national landscape, was in itself a political statement. Or the wide variety of work produced by Chinese artists in wartime aren't all masterpieces, but they include a high proportion of works of great interest and great singularity. In 1939, when this image on the left was painted, control of Shanghai was split between the Japanese army and the ongoing uneasy presence of the international settlement, which didn't fall to the Japanese until 1941 in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor. This is the setting for Ballard's great novel, Empire of the Sun, and the film which Steven Spielberg made of it. The prosperous boulevard of Nanjing Road lies in what was the international settlement, um, it was the pride of not just its colonial masters, but of a wider audience. However, the painter Zhao Wang Yun makes this sort of architectural setting the backdrop to a miserable crowd of workers knocking off from their grinding labors. It's a poignant image of a miserable quotidian existence and backbreaking toil. A reminder that for many of China's millions, living conditions were awful even before the war made them much worse. It makes the strongest possible contrast with the epic bombast of what may be one of the worst pictures painted in 20th century China. At least it never fails to get a giggle when I show it in class. Uh, its artist, Tang Yihe, had studied in Paris in the 1930s. Um, and like so many of the institutions of education, the art school he worked at was relocated to Sichuan in 1938. And it must have been here that he painted this work transcribing its iconography directly from a great Rubens canvas in Munich, which at this time was already facing its own risks from Allied bombing. One assumes that hardly anybody not trained in European art would have grasped what this was about, since naked winged blonde females with wreaths have no immediate connotations of victory in pre-modern Chinese art. The Chinese facial features of the warrior aren't themselves sufficient to bring this picture into a Chinese sphere of meaning, and it has to be judged a failure. But I think there's something just a little heroic in its badness, its attempt to conjure a set of meanings out of intractable material, as an artist of modest talents tries to make those talents cope with unprecedented demands. More immediately meaningful to a Chinese audience would be another work with a man and a sword, this image of the demon-quelling demigod Zhong Kui. Now, demons are guizhe in Chinese, and guizhe was the abusive term used for foreigners in general, and the Japanese in particular, at this time. So this is a very pertinent image um, in 1941 when it was painted. But is it actually any better as a picture? The anatomy of the picture is frankly pretty dreadful. I'm remembering that Xu Bei Hong won prizes for anatomy in Paris, but here the left arm is unfeasibly elongated and the right wrist is simply unbelievable. It's perhaps topped by another fairly risable Xu Bei Hong 
his Mountain Goddess of 1943, which similarly attempts to meld the anatomical traditions of Paris with the expressive brushwork of the Guohua tradition. Now, we could read this as just another example of badness in painting, or see it more positively, as a testimony again to an ongoing refusal to do either or, to continue, even in wartime, the struggle for something distinctive and modern. But either way, there was too much going on for anybody to pay too much attention. Particularly so, as a genuinely popular culture of mass media continued through wartime, and I'm showing you on the left a spread taken from the 1940 issue of Liang Yao, two comically juxtaposed photos in which a crowd of completely naked men appear to ogle a beauty in a fashionable swimsuit. The English caption and the Chinese caption, interestingly, don't say exactly the same thing, and thus create the sort of ambiguity we've already seen in Fang Junbi's native uh, naked bather. Now, this may not raise much more than a smile, but smiles were in precious short supply as the war dragged on and on. A massive scroll named Refugees um, uses the Chinese medium of brush and ink um, alongside imported conventions of figure drawing to try and capture realistically the devastation and suffering of the millions forced to flee their homes. In the center of this section of the long scroll, a woman holds a dead child while around her figures cover their eyes and their mouths and their ears to shut out the horrors engulfing them. The unfinished nature of this work, with certain figures just sketched in in charcoal, only adds to its power, I think, by pointing to the snatched nature of creativity in a time of terror. Just as realistic, but much more tranquil, is another painting focusing on the lives of ordinary people, Zhuang Yen's People of Northern Shanxi. Here, an old woman with a piece of knitting or some other kind of handwork stands over a small child who plays in the mud with an animal, probably a piglet. Here we're definitely in the countryside, among real people, members of China's millions. But this sort of picture, too, was to come under the stricture of bad art, and for reasons quite different from the failures of aesthetics we might attribute to some of the things I've just been showing. The title locates this picture to a particular part of China, to the impoverished and arid backwoods of northern Shanxi province in the northwest, an area beyond Japanese control, but also beyond the control of the government of the Republic of China in Chongqing. We are in Yan'an, capital of the Shanganning border region, the remote area the size of Portugal, controlled from 1937 by the Chinese Communist Party, who had taken refuge there at the end of the epic retreat, later called the Long March. Its population of roughly one and a half million people provided the raw material for the party's development of strategies, which would bring it total power in China only a dozen years later. But nobody knew this in 1937, and it's important not to see what happened as the only thing that could have happened. When an artist like Zhuang Yen made his way to Yan'an in 1937, this can hardly be seen as furthering his career. Rather, the impulse to do so came from an idealistic sense that only the utterly radical positions of the communists had the possibility of saving China from external invasion and from the poverty and backwardness of its rural population. The luster of Yan'an as revolutionary shrine makes it very difficult now to talk about what actually went on there. So perhaps a set of mythologized images are the best we can hope for. I'm juxtaposing here for maximum effect two official images of the nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek and of Mao Zedong, who at Yan'an asserted final dominance over his rivals for control of the parties. Both of these are propaganda. The buttoned up and bemedaled Jiang versus the folksy and relaxed Mao. But I think they capture something of the attraction to a genre, of a generation of predominantly young cultural figures who made their way to Yan'an to make revolution. A good proportion of them are gathered in this photograph, and, and note how few they are. And there's Mao in the middle, um, presiding in May 1942 
over the Yen'an Forum on Literature and Art, a conference topped and tailed by two speeches from him. It's a moot point how much Mao Zedong cared about the visual arts, as opposed to literature, which certainly mattered to him a lot. Certainly his speeches at the forum say nothing specific about visual art, and his few concrete examples don't include any from this sphere. But it's perfectly clear that the same set of prescriptions apply to all creative endeavors. Using the simple base and superstructure model of Soviet Marxism, and quoting Lenin on the role of the arts as cogs and wheels in the whole revolutionary machine, Mao states that all our literature and art are for the masses of the people, and in the first place, for the workers, peasants, and soldiers. They are created for the workers, peasants, and soldiers, and are for their use. Any notion of art as an autonomous realm of activity is ruled out. So Zhuang Yen's muted palant and lack of revolutionary oomph therefore dooms his image of the peasantry to criticism, however realistic it might be. But at the same time, and here Mao shows his formation in the May 4th period, he makes it clear that art has to be good. What we demand is the unity of politics and art, the unity of content and form, the unity of revolutionary political content, and the highest possible perfection of artistic form. Now, like much of holy writ, and this is what Mao's talks would become, there's plenty of scope for ambiguity. In the first instance, it was much easier to address the need for artists to talk to a, a rural audience than it was to think about the highest possible perfection of artistic form. So the woodcut prints made at Yen'an concentrated on the upbeat and the hortatory. They lauded the farmer who had achieved high levels of productivity, which all could emulate, or they trumpeted the abundant food and clothing which would be available to the peasant household under communist rule. They transformed the party's army and militia forces into protective door gods, borrowing a strategy which, as we have seen, had already been in place in nationalist controlled areas for some years. But there was always a degree of ambivalence on the part of intellectuals, especially communist intellectuals, about folk forms of visuality, which were at once deeply authentic and so good, and also deeply tied to superstition, poverty, and backwardness, and so bad, very bad indeed. It was much more comfortable to speak about the people than to speak with them. And we can see this in a work like this print, produced by a Yenan-based artist, showing peasants demanding a reduction in their rent. The subject matter is impeccable, both a testimony to communist success in mobilizing the masses and an exhortation to emulation and further struggle. But the style, with its complex multi-figure composition rendered in austere modernist black and white, moves far away from the images um, pe uh, peasants had long consumed. The audience for an image like this was at least as much a global one. Yen An was, despite the myth, no pristine utopia sealed from the outside. And in fact, exhibitions by wartime artists from both nationalist and communist controlled areas were held in Chongqing, while works like this were published and displayed in the USA and Canada, um, as well as in Moscow. Wartime art in China cannot be reduced um, to the hortatory woodcut, nor should we read the art of the period through the lens of histories constructed later to make what happened seem like the only thing that could have happened. Artists working in both guohua and in oils uh, responded in a wide variety of ways to the particular stresses and the particular dislocations of audiences and art worlds. And this diversity only continued when the sudden surrender of the Japanese in 1945 brought the war to an end. It was very rapidly succeeded in China by the outbreak of an equally destructive and savage four-year civil war between American-backed nationalist forces and Soviet-backed communists. Remember, there was never anything very cold about the Cold War in Asia. A prominent historian of the Civil War have written, has written of these grim years as a cultural wasteland, 
But this assertion is contradicted by the artworks which survive from this period. Indeed, the terrible economic dislocation of the Civil War with the value of middle class incomes collapsing as the currency did may have spurred visual artists to produce more just to feed their families. The sketches of Fun Zakai were hugely popular with war shattered audiences. The commercially successful Guohua masters of the 1940s all restarted production at this period, and the range of style in which they work was at if anything, even greater than it had been before the war. In February 1948, the decision was taken by the nationalist government to ship those selected treasures of the old imperial collection, which had been removed from Beijing to keep them safe from the Japanese. These were then shipped to the island of Taiwan. The early nature of this decision points to the collapse of nationalist morale, but we still need to resist the temptation to see communist victory as inevitable. Certainly, many intellectuals were involved in efforts to find a third way between them, although the murder of the poet Wen Yidou by nationalist, assassination, by nationalist assassins in 1946 was a shocking reminder of the limited freedom of maneuver they enjoyed. No painter, as far as I know, suffered the same fate at this time, although someone like Pan Yu Liang, whose self-portrait you see here on the left, chose to remain abroad. Equally pensive, even enigmatic, are the faces of Pang Xun Qin's modernist couple on the right, filling the whole space of the canvas in a way which seems to blot out the outside world. But that outside world went on, and the commercial art world of posters and graphics um, seen here in this photograph taken in Shanghai in 1948, this remained the way in which most urban audiences engaged with the visual world. A year later, in early 1949, when this colorful calendar showing the communist political leader Mao Zedong and their military commander Zhu De, when this was published, the final outcome of civil war was obvious to many. The clear dependence of this image on folk prototypes, images of the kitchen god and his wife as worshipped at the Lunar New Year, this perhaps might have been taken as a sign of the aesthetic preferences of the victors, utterly unknown to most in those major Chinese cities now beginning to fall under communist control. Some artists left the country, among them the leading Guohua star Zhang Datian. Other scholars and intellectuals returned keen to be a part of the building of what was being proclaimed as New China, rising out of the chaos and misery. Most just remained with differing degrees of commitment to the new regime and different resources with which to meet its requirements for an art at the service of the people. In 1949, Zhang Zhaohe, who just six years earlier had painted the massive scroll recording the sufferings of bombed out refugees, he painted this work and inscribed it on the very day that the southernmost metropolis of Canton achieved liberation. He wrote on it, to work strenuously, to support progress with a rich harvest. In newly reborn China, peasants and workers have united. All parties and factions have united with a single goal, friendship to China and the Soviet Union, peace to the world. We have no reason to believe the optimism was forced in his case, nor in that of Hu Yichuan, who must have been at the very same time working on his great oil painting, Breaking the Fetters, an icon of liberation in which the People's Liberation Army strikes the shackles from the feet of the miserably confined. To this veteran leftist radical, it may have seemed as if the exhortation of his 1932 woodcut to the front had been answered now, in full measure, and with total victory, a mere 17 years later. But what this would actually mean for artists, their work, and their audiences in New China, that will be the theme of my third and final lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.